Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. The study of ecology considers population growth with birth rates and death rates, regulation and intraspecific and interspecific competition, mutualism, and predation. Focusing on adaptations, physiological ecology is concerned with the responses of individual organisms to temperature, moisture, light, and other environmental conditions. Closely associated with population and evolutionary ecology is community ecology, which deals with the physical and biological structure of communities and community development. To launch into inquiries, we investigate population genetics. Population ecology is evolutionary ecology that deals with the role of natural selection in physical and behavioral adaptations and speciation. The process in which one species gives rise to multiple species that exploit different features of the environment, such as food resources or habitats, is called adaptive radiation. The different features of the environment exert the selection pressures that push the population in various directions, and reproductive isolation, the necessary condition for speciation to occur, is often a byproduct of the changes in morphology, behavior, or habitat preferences that are the actual targets of selection. Speciation is the evolutionary process by which populations evolve to become distinct species. Charles Darwin was the first to describe the role of natural selection in speciation in his 1859 book, The Origin of the Species. He also identified sexual selection as a likely but problematic mechanism. There are four geographic modes of speciation in nature, based on the extent to which speciating populations are isolated from one another. Allopatric, peripatric, parapatric, and sympatric. Focus on these terms, know how to define them, apply them to populations you observe, and be able to give examples of how you understand these instances. Speciation occurs when biological populations of the same species become isolated from each other to an extent that prevents or interferes with gene flow. The separated populations develop adaptive responses to their restrictive environments. Huh. We look for the examples to prove it. In parapatric speciation, one population bifurcates into two subpopulations of a species, evolving in reproductive isolation from one another, while continuing to exchange genes. This mode of speciation has three distinguishing characteristics. One, mating occurs non-randomly. Two, gene flow occurs unequally. And three, populations exist in either continuous or discontinuous geographic ranges. This distribution pattern may be the result of unequal dispersal, incomplete geographic barriers, or divergent expressions of behavior, among other things. Parapatric speciation predicts that hybrid zones will often exist at the junction between the two new populations. Natural selection is the primary driver in parapatric speciation, and the strength of the selection during divergence is often an important factor. Parapatric speciation may also result from the reproductive isolation caused by social selection, that is, individuals interacting altruistically. Due to the continuous nature of parapatric population distribution, population niches will often overlap producing a continuum in the species' ecological role across an environmental gradient. Reduced gene flow of parapatric speciation often produces a cline in which a variation in evolutionary pressures causes a change to occur in allele frequencies within a gene pool of each differentiating population. This is enabled through environmental gradients that ultimately results in genetically distinct sister species. This is parapatric speciation. Throughout this speciation series, we have been looking at these chubby and happy Roosevelt elk, 
Service Canadensis variety Roosevelti on the left side screen, opposing the Rocky Mountain elk, Service Canadensis variety Nelsoni. Members of the genus Service are descendants of Cervus genome first appearing in the fossil record 25 million years ago during the Oligocene epoch in Eurasia, but they do not appear in North American fossil record until the early Miocene, about 23 million years ago. Think about the current ice age that started about 34 million years before present. Members of the North American service genus have been developing within these restrictive environments since that time. The North American name bearer was Cervus canadensis variety canadensis, but it has been considered extinct since 1 September 1877, when the last elk bull was shot in Pennsylvania as a hunting season success. Huh. Oops. Oh no! No! Redeem the villain! Taekwondo dos! Attack! Subspecies of the Cervus genus are groups at the first stage of speciation. Individuals of different subspecies sometimes interbreed, but they normally produce sterile male offspring. At the second stage of incipient species, or semi-species, individuals of these groups rarely interbreed, and all their surviving male offspring are sterile. We see this incident with deer we already talked about. Roosevelt elk are the largest of the four surviving subspecies of elk, Cervus canadensis, in North America by body mass. Although by antler size, records have Rocky Mountain elk antlers being the largest. Think about that adaptation. Elk in the Olympic Peninsula live in temperate rainforests with thick understory plant communities, dense trees with branching to the ground. Big antlers may be advantageous to show intraspecies dominance, but when they get hung up in the understory while being pursued by predators, they may be a liability. This is an act of species selection to reward survivors. Rocky Mountain elk in Yellowstone National Park live in the temperate coniferous and hardwood forests and rangelands. Big antlers are not a liability to be hung up in the understory brush or in low-hanging tree branches. But they sure serve a purpose when being attacked by a pack of wolves. These two varieties of elk are in the first and second stage of speciation. They have demonstrated ample evidence of speciation adaptations to different environmental restrictions. Hm. I ask you now, what form of speciation explains this? Cervus canadensis variety Roosevelti is genetically different from Cervus canadensis variety Nelsoni. In parapatic speciation, two subpopulations of a species evolve reproductive isolation from one another while they partially continue to exchange genes. When we consider the geographic discontinuity from Forks, Washington, across the Cascade Mountains, through the Great Basin, and into North Idaho, and then climb over the Rocky Mountains, and finally into Wyoming to find the Yellowstone hotspot, we see plenty of reason to recognize geographic discontinuities. There are still genes being shared between subpopulations, but it is not continuous, and success in one area will not perfectly translate into advantages in the next. This distribution pattern may be the result of unequal dispersal, incomplete geographical barriers, or divergent expressions of behavior, among other things. Parapatric speciation predicts that hybrid zones will often exist at these junctions between the two populations. In biogeography, the terms parapatric and parapatry are often used to describe the relationship between organisms whose ranges do not significantly overlap, but are immediately adjacent to one another. They do not occur together except in a narrow contact zone. In this scenario, we would expect nearest neighbors to share genes and produce semi-viable offspring, but then to see unsuccessful offspring from participants at the far reaches of these subpopulations, like between an elk parent in Forks, Washington, 
mating with one from Roswell, New Mexico. Their genetic drift is expected to be significant for one another, and their offspring would not be expected to be viable, especially with males. Resources are often limited in a habitat, and many species may compete to get a hold of them. Elk along this river compete for food, nutrients, water, and space. They also compete for all these resources with deer, beavers, and other herbivores in the same space. We explored the concept of an ecological niche and saw how species having similar niches leads to competition. We explored how species can evolve by natural selection to occupy different niches, thus divvying up resources and minimizing direct competition.